Hey guys, and welcome to the Moms and Mysteries podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Mandy. How are you? <laughs> I think I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm good. You know what? We have not had technical problems in so long. I feel like we've been incredibly lucky in the podcast world, not really having very many. It's extremely rare for us to run into a technical problem, which actually is pretty That's remarkable shocking. considering who we are. <laughs> it's shocking. <laughs> I think God basically knows I cannot give one more challenge to these two. And so we just <laughs> have gotten a real nice pass. But for whatever reason, we had some today, but we figured it out after switching browsers and we're here. We're here now. And that's what's important. We made it. Yeah. I feel like, I don't know, we're There's a Shania really Twain on a roll. About it. Last week, I came in also saying that I wasn't prepared to start the show and now people are probably like, what's going on with you guys? But there's really nothing. I don't know. I feel like it's just been two weird weeks back to back at the start. It's a weird <laughs> life if I'm going to take it one step further. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing our best here. We really are. So we have a monster of a story this week. In fact, we are going to do it in two parts, but we're going to do it like we did the last time we had a two-parter. So if you're on Patreon Monday night, we're going to have both parts. So normally we drop them on Sunday, but we'll do both parts Monday night. And if you're an Apple Podcast subscriber, you'll see both episodes are available if you subscribe to the monthly subscription thing where you get no ads, get early releases. And when we have two-parters, you'll get both parts at the same time. Perfect. Yeah. Seems to work out really well doing it that way. I think um, a lot of people had positive feedback. They said they really enjoyed being able to listen to part two right away. So yeah, so we're trying that out again and we'll see how you guys feel about it. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. So there's really no way to get into this story other than just jumping right in. It is absolutely wild. So that's what we're going to do. We're just going to jump right into it. On the afternoon of December 3rd, 1998, Officers responded to a 911 call regarding a woman that had just been found dead. Mark Jensen, the woman's husband, had just returned home from picking the couple's kids up from school when he discovered that his 40-year-old wife, Julie, was not breathing. At 4.35 p.m., first responders found her lying on her bed face down with her face partially buried in the pillow. She had no pulse and all signs pointed to her having passed quite some time earlier, so no effort was made to revive her. Officers from the Pleasant Prairie Police Department spoke with Mark to find out more about what happened to his wife, and he told them that he really didn't know, but he suspected that she might have suffered from a bad reaction to some medications that she recently started taking, and those medications were Paxil and Ambien. Mark told Detective Paul Ratzberg that Julie had actually been in strange form ever since she woke up that morning. It was as early as 7.30 in the morning that Mark said he was having to prop Julie up in bed because she was so incoherent and could hardly even sit up. He said she really wasn't able to move around or function, and her breathing was very labored to the point that she could only make these grunting sounds but couldn't actually speak, which is like, that sounds like a terrifying way to find your wife first thing in the morning. Absolutely. So instead of calling an ambulance, though, Mark decided that he would take their kids to school and one of them had to go to daycare. And then he came back home for a little while before running an errand for work. After this errand, he went straight to pick up the kids from school. And when they got home, Mark said that something just didn't feel right. So he had the kids stay in the car while he went inside. And that's when he found his wife dead. If you're thinking that this all sounds a little bit suspicious, you wouldn't be the only one. Detective Ratzberg felt the same way. He said that healthy 40-year-old women don't typically just die like this, and there was really a lot to be investigated and a lot to be revealed. Before she was Mark's wife and the mother of his kids, Julie was born Julie Carol Griffin on February 26, 1958. She and her five brothers grew up in Kenosha, Wisconsin, where she excelled in school. She maintained straight A's and was on the honor roll all throughout middle and high school. Julie even took German and participated as an exchange student to Germany while in high school. Julie really loved music and she started playing the accordion at a young age. And later she sang in the choir and she played violin in the school orchestra. Her family said she enjoyed the company of others, but she was a quiet, gentle type with a carefree and easygoing nature. Julie met her future husband, Mark, while attending Trimper High School. They were high school sweethearts who remained together after Julie graduated in 1976, one year before Mark. Both of them ended up attending the University of Wisconsin in Oshkosh. 
Julie was going to school for nursing, and we're not exactly sure what Mark was taking classes for, but after college, he became a successful stockbroker. While in college, he ran a business painting houses while Julie worked at a nursing home. When she had time, she would also help him with painting these houses to help pay for her own school cost. During her time working at the nursing home, Julie had a change of heart when it came to a career in nursing. She learned that she emotionally really couldn't handle this devastation she would feel when she lost a patient of hers, and she decided that nursing really wasn't going to be for her. Even though she was near graduation, Julie actually quit the nursing program and started working as a bank teller. She eventually went to work at Thompson McKinnon in Lake Bluff, Illinois, and earned the license to become an investment broker. Mark and Julie got married on April 14, 1984. The couple took their honeymoon in Jamaica before settling in an upscale neighborhood of Pleasant Prairie that borders Lake Michigan. Julie became an active member of the neighborhood, and she would attend all the neighborhood parties, and she even joined a neighborhood book club. And her neighbors thought really highly of her. They said that she was very soft-spoken, very kind, and was always looking out for everybody in the neighborhood. In January of 1990, Julie and Mark had their first son, who we'll call Derek. Julie became a stay-at-home mom, and things started to just get a lot more stressful in the Jensen household. Derek was a very colicky baby, which if you've ever, as a mom, experienced having a colicky baby, just even thinking back to those days when I had babies that were the age where they had colic, it just yeah, it makes me like recoil literally thinking I'm like, nope, I definitely could <laughs> never have another baby now. Right? Just thinking about that, it's such a hard time. So I really, yeah, so I think we can all relate to how stressful that is for new parents. But according to Julie's family, Mark wasn't really all that helpful when it came to dealing with the new baby. On top of not really being helpful or supportive, he was also insisting that Julie not fall behind on these household chores that he wanted done. He really wanted their place to be spotless, and she was also to have all these meals ready on time. Julie later told her brother Paul that Mark made Julie do all the work because he never wanted any kids, and so... When she wanted to start a family, it was kind of like, okay, fine, we'll do this, but you have to do all of it. Man. Yeah. So in June of 1990, when Derek was about six months old, Julie started seeing a psychologist named Paul DeFazio for feelings of depression. She saw this doctor a total of three times. At first, he diagnosed her with something called adult situation reaction with mixed features, which is a very mild form of depression. But later on, he actually changed his opinion and thought that Julie's depression was more middle of the scale. One of Julie's chief complaints was that she didn't want to go back to work, but she instead wanted to continue to stay home with Derek, who at that point was nearly nine months old. She said that Mark didn't have any interest in their child and that he wasn't an active participant in the childcare duties. So that, of course, makes her feel even more like she needs to be home with the baby. Dr. DeFazio suggested that Julie try some Prozac, which she agreed to, so he gave her some samples to take home. She said that the medication did make her feel better, but she never actually filled a prescription for it, and she decided to cancel her upcoming appointments with the doctor, and instead she decided to seek out marriage counseling with her husband, Mark. So Mark initially did agree to go in with Julie and speak to Dr. DeFazio to discuss how he could possibly help their marriage, but he ended up canceling many more appointments than he actually went to, and when he did show up, most of the time he talked about how Julie was the problem. Mark would complain that Julie was too involved with their child, which is like, okay, you have a baby that's under a year old, like you should be too involved (laughs) with Yeah, (laughs) there really isn't an option. (laughs) There's really not, yeah. You're like their whole world. Yeah, yeah. So because Mark was complaining about this, you know, saying that she was too involved with the child, this led to Julie actually trying to return to work part time, but her commute was two hours per day. So it just honestly is such a mess to travel that far every day and you're only even working part time. Yeah. All your paychecks basically going to the daycare that you put your baby in. Like it's just, you know, we've all been in that kind of situation too. So the doctor said that he thought Mark was introverted, emotionally stoic, and unequipped and overwhelmed by fatherhood, which, okay, sure, but parenthood is hard, but we all got to step up to the plate here, right? (laughs) But you just do it. Right. So at some point in 1991, while things were rocky between Julie and Mark, Julie had a brief affair with a man from work named Patrick. Julie told a friend that Mark just didn't love her anymore at this point. One weekend, Mark was away and Julie invited Patrick over for dinner. 
After dinner, Julie asked Patrick to spend the night, which he did, and they ended up sleeping together. However, after that encounter, Julie told Patrick she didn't want any more contact with him and she abruptly ended things. But Mark did find out about the affair at some point after that. We're not sure if Julie told him or if he just found out on his own. In June of 1991, Julie filed for divorce. But after, Mark threatened Julie by saying she'd never see their son again. So she withdrew the petition and the couple got back together. As we said before, Julie was friendly with their neighbors, and after the failed divorce attempt, she confided in a neighbor that we'll call Brian. She told Brian that Mark was incredibly controlling and that he made her do ridiculous things to keep tabs on her, such as wearing a cordless phone on her even when she was outside gardening. Keep in mind, there's no (laughs) cell phones back then. It's a hunk of junk. Those things are so big. Back when we got mobile, not mobile, but wireless phones they were huge yeah i'm gonna bring it out to the garden and would it even work in the garden i don't feel like we had (laughs) i feel like we were still pretty tethered inside yeah the farther you got away from the little base station it just would start being staticky i do remember that yeah i do remember that honestly you (laughs) saying that reminds me but i had totally forgotten that's exactly what it'd do so you'd be like running inside to you know be able to speak to your friend (laughs) so julie also told brian that mark would leave her a list of chores to do during the day on top of the usual things that she was doing to keep the house immaculate at all times. Plus, she's taking care of this baby. She's running errands, and she's cooking meals. Then when Mark got home from work, the whole family would drop everything so they could all participate in something called daddy time. At some point, Mark told Julie to quit working again and go back to being home full time, but he still required Julie to tell him where she was at all times. And we still have so much more to get into, and we'll do that after a quick break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. And now back to the episode. So before the break, we were talking about this relationship between Mark and Julie Jensen, who were a couple from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Although they were high school sweethearts, the couple really did not have a fairy tale marriage. And when they welcomed their first son, things only got worse. Julie was left to do all the child rearing as well as all the housework, and Mark became more and more controlling over her, leaving her with these feelings of anxiousness and depression. Julie eventually had a very brief affair, but she quickly ended things with her lover and soon filed for divorce from Mark. But Mark wasn't going to let Julie go that easily. He told her that if she tried to divorce him, she would never see their son again. So then in 1992, the most bizarre thing of all happened. Julie began finding these random pornographic images inside of their home, around the family's yard, and in her car. So (laughs) there's just really no friendly way of saying this. If you have, this is probably not a great episode for your kids to listen to with you. If they're still in the room, maybe get them out of here. But these photos that she was finding all over their property were mostly involving, as I phrased it, ding-dongs near a woman's face. And uh, Mark said that he was also getting these same types of photos at his job, Uh, while he was at work, someone is just randomly sending him pictures like this to harass him. Yeah. So uh, he theorized that somebody was actually breaking into their home to plant these images there. But not just anyone. He specifically said that he thought it was Patrick, who was the man that Julie had this one-time encounter with the year prior. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense why he doesn't doesn't really make a lot of sense, period. (laughs) So Julie was so upset about this that these images just like kept popping up that she and Mark actually hired a private investigator to look into who was responsible. And they even installed video cameras around their home in an effort to catch whoever was doing it. This went on, Melissa, literally for years. And so I cannot That's imagine. That's wild. That is wild. It's just living wild. your life and it's a dong wild. shows up. It's wild. Yeah. Like I said, I said, just every day you're driving around, you're minding your business, and you know that you run the risk of having like a jump scare because like a random unsolicited like penis picture just like shows up out of nowhere. Like, I honestly, it's pretty terrifying <laughs> to tell you the truth. <laughs> honestly, if you were to make a scary movie about my life, that could be it. Right. It would just like, ruin my life. That would be the scariest thing I just want to, to make a parody of this now. Okay. But this was actually real. So this actually happened. So terrible. Yeah. So eventually, Julie got linked up with this police officer named Ronald Cosman, and he was supposed to be helping her figure out the source of these unwanted images. He responded to calls regarding the pictures about 30 times in total, and it even got to the point where he was just swinging by the Jensen home as many as 10 times a year 
just to kind of check in and see if things had quieted down, which is like – Honestly, the what? fact that this is years is – True. This is like the watcher type yeah, of, yeah. you know, like dealing with somebody. Yes. This is wild. Yeah. So Officer Kosman actually at some point started suspecting that Mark was the person behind all of it, but he never was able to gather enough evidence to prove it. And just a little spoiler alert here. He was right. But we're going to save the rest of that story for later. But just know Mark was the person planting these images as a way to taunt his wife, Julie. Wild. I can't. I mean, like, you're also like hiring a private investigator. You're taking this so many steps. You're having to, I guess, print these out. How does any of this work? This is just too much. And and for what? I mean, that's just right. A deeply sick thing to do. It really is. And and knowing that like it bothers Julie and like yes. honestly, just like that's so just awful. So in the meantime, though, Julie got pregnant with their second child at some point in 1994. But that didn't stop Mark from demanding that Julie continue to do literally everything. In early 1995, Julie was about seven months pregnant when Mark had her outside ripping apart an old porch and nailing down new lumber. I cannot. I cannot with this man. I actually tried to do a few silly things like this when I was pregnant, except that was just like my nesting pregnancy brain. Like, oh, you can totally take on a massive project like this, right? But like, oh, yeah. The, Thankfully, my husband was always like, you're not doing that. <laughs> like, at yeah, seven months like, pregnant. good like, try. Not, yeah, exactly. Um, but Mark told Julie that this was her contribution to the family because Julie had no job, which was because he told her she couldn't have a job. Yeah, so, I like, feel like growing an entire human is is a pretty big job. Yeah, He's but it's just it. the gaslighting and like just the – like you can see – the things that he's doing to her, like mentally to like get under her oh, skin yeah. and like control and manipulate her. It's just absolutely terrible. So Julie's friend and the neighbor, uh, Brian, that we mentioned before, saw that she was actually struggling to get this job done. No kidding. So he sent some of his own workers to go over and help her. Julie ended up giving birth to their second son, who we'll call Daryl, in March of 1995. And things between her and Mark did not improve. Even Brian witnessed Mark getting angry at Julie on several different occasions. And Julie confided in Brian that she and Mark would fight over everything, including going on vacation. And she said that one of their recent fights was actually about that. And when they would go on vacation, Mark would normally just hire a babysitter and want to stay out all night long partying and going to strip clubs. So, of course, Julie is not interested in that. And she didn't want to go, which caused some issues between them. Another point of contention was when Julie invited her father to stay with them for a week. Um, he was actually dying of cancer at the time, and Julie just wanted to spend some time with him. But Mark threw a complete fit about it and made her father get a hotel room. Wow. Yeah. So when her dad actually came to their house to visit, the Jensen's dog really took a liking to him. And after Julie's father went home, Julie kept bringing up how much the dog really liked her dad. And Mark... I'm not really sure the details of this, but he had the dog killed. I don't know if he just like went and had the dog put down or if it was more sinister than that. But that's really the only like information we have is that he oh had the dog gosh. killed. So monster. What a monster. Because the dog liked someone else. Right. Like, you know, she wasn't saying, oh, my dad, he likes my dad more than you. Like she's not right. going to do that to this guy. She knows what kind of guy he is. But to do this is just, oh my gosh. Terrible. Absolutely the worst. So at some time in or around 1995, the Jensen's older son, Derek, started kindergarten, and Julie then became a volunteer at his school. Julie continued to struggle with Mark's controlling behaviors for the next few years. At some point before August in 1998, Mark started working at a new stockbroking firm. Looking back, this marked a time of noticeable change in Mark's personality. The neighbor Brian noticed that he started to become even more critical of Julie and would say super hurtful things to her, including stuff like she was a bad mom and even that she was a bad influence on her kids. A couple of months after starting this new job, Mark started having a flirtatious relationship with a coworker named Kelly. They started off exchanging emails, but eventually their relationship did turn into a full sexual affair. 
During this time, Julie noticed that Mark was less affectionate towards her and that he would often come home from work and go straight to the computer. Julie actually told Officer Cosman, the one who was looking into the case of these pictures that kept showing up, that things in the Jensen household were very cold. Julie also started to confide in her son's third grade teacher. It was easy to become friends with the teacher because Julie volunteered at the school, and that was probably one of the only places that Mark allowed her to go to by herself. She told the teacher about the affair that she had had years before and how she went to Dr. DeFazio for counseling. Dr. DeFazio happened to be the teacher's brother-in-law. So in this conversation, Julie said that Mark essentially told the doctor that Julie was crazy. Julie said that she was worried that Mark would do whatever it took to make her seem mentally unfit if she filed for divorce. During the same month, which was September, Julie began talking to her neighbor Brian a lot more, every single day to be exact. And Brian noticed that Julie seemed to be a little down, but he didn't notice any change in her appearance or her demeanor. On September 21st, Julie visited the family doctor who concluded that Julie might have some mild depression, but we don't believe he prescribed anything for her at that time. So by November, things were really starting to get weird. Mark was spending a lot of time on his work computer looking up information about possible drug interactions, which he told his coworker and friend Stephen that he was doing out of concern for what he was calling unusual behavior allegedly he had noticed in Julie. Mark told Stephen that Julie was sickly, depressed, and had lost so much weight that she was hardly recognizable. Stephen went home that night and told his wife about all of this, and his wife was so concerned about Julie that she called her right away to set up a lunch date with her. When Julie showed up to that lunch date, to everyone's surprise, she looked completely normal and appeared to be perfectly fine. So in early November, Mark attended a national sales convention in St. Louis, and he was gone for a few days. While he was on this trip, he went out for drinks with a fellow stockbroker, and we'll call him Charles. So Mark proceeded to get kind of drunk, and the two men started doing this griping session about their wives. And Mark told Charles that if someone wanted to get rid of their wife, there was actually websites with instructions on how you could pull it off by using undetectable poisons. That's very specific that he would like. Incredibly specific. Yeah, yeah. Mark went on to explain that if you were to give somebody doses of Benadryl and antifreeze over a long period of time, it would be mostly untraceable and would start, quote, crystallizing you from the inside out. Wow. Yeah, just such a sick thing to say. Mm -hmm. Charles felt that the discussion was really weird and seemed to be, the way that Mark was describing it, it seemed like it was more of a legitimate plan that he had concocted than just you know, sharing this information. So the next day, Charles told one of his other co-workers about this, but he did not go to the police because at the time, he said he didn't take Mark that seriously. Little did Charles know, Mark actually had been spending a lot of time looking this up. A little more than two weeks earlier, he had used his home computer to search for botulism, which is a rare illness caused by a toxin that attacks the nerves and causes difficulty breathing, muscle paralysis, and can even cause death. It's a big thing they tell you to be really careful with babies, with um, honey, not to right? give them honey. And I think there's a couple of other things that you're not supposed to give babies because of the risk of botulism. Uh, so Mark went to a website entitled Botulism in Low Acid Canned Foods. The day after he looked at botulism, Mark read a story about a pipe bomber that was sentenced for trying to blow up his estranged wife. And after that, he went to another site where he looked at something about a chemical detonator from a book called The Anarchist Cookbook. I don't know how he even came across that. But um, but so after that, he sent some emails to Kelly, which was the woman that, from work that he was having an affair with. And then he did a few work-related things on the computer before he went back and searched pipe bombs again. He ended his internet session that day back at the Anarchist Cookbook. On November 9th, Mark used his home computer to access a site entitled, quote, Physician Assisted Suicide, and another site entitled Toxicology. It was around the middle of November when neighbor Brian noticed that Mark pretty much stopped communicating with him at all and started ignoring him, even when the two would be just a few feet from each other. Julie told Brian that she and Mark were arguing every single day at this point and that she was suspicious that he was having an affair. She said Mark had been going on these overnight trips to Chicago. Julie also told Brian that Mark threatened to make her out to be an unfit mother if she ever tried to leave him, and he told her that she'd never see their kids again. 
Meanwhile, he was pressuring Julie to go see a doctor and to put their youngest son in daycare as well as getting a job. As Julie's friendship with Brian grew stronger, she told him more and more things. In mid-November, she said that one night she saw that the nightstand in the bedroom was cracked open, and when she looked inside the drawer, she saw syringes. She said that she and Mark had a huge fight that night, and he kept trying to get her to drink a glass of wine. He was following her around and putting it next to her, and this actually went on till three in the morning, but Julie said she refused to drink the wine because she had this crazy idea that Mark may have put something in it, and he was going to use the syringes to inject her with something else, which is terrifying, thinking your spouse is offering you something that could be poisoning, I know. could and kill you. Like- the insistence of it. Like I'm sitting here trying to picture like my husband literally chasing me around the house, like drink this glass of wine. Like, of course I'm not going to drink that. Are you crazy? Until three in the morning? Like at some point, yeah, there's just, poor Julie. So Julie specifically stated that she was scared she was going to be poisoned to death by Mark. Not long after this, Julie told Brian that she found some sticky notes with different sites for poisoning on Mark's desk and that she had seen a site about poisoning left open on Mark's browser when he left the computer on. She said, quote, I don't know what Mark is trying to do to me. If he's trying to scare me, he's playing with my mind, or if he just forgot to turn it off, end quote. Which is scary anyway, because why would he just be browsing things about poisoning? So Brian told Julie to take some photos of the screen the next time and to also file a report with the police. He later said that Julie seemed very suspicious that Mark was trying to poison her or to make her look like an unfit mother to take the kids from her. Since Mark was demanding that Julie get a job, she had an interview with the school principal for a part-time secretary position at the school on November 20th. The next day, November 21st, Julie met up with Brian for their usual daily chat. And on this day, she gave him an envelope and a roll of film, and she asked him to keep these items and give them to the police if anything were to ever happen to her. Brian didn't read the letter, but he did hang on to it. A few days later, Julie was at the school volunteering in her son's class, and the teacher noticed that she was just acting really strange. It seemed like Julie was really nervous and on edge, but also that she was really hesitant to talk about what it was that was bothering her. So the teacher eventually told Julie that whenever she was ready, she could tell her whatever was on her mind. At that moment, Julie started to kind of wring her hands together and she said, I don't know if I should be telling you this. I think my husband is going to kill me. The teacher, of course, was taken aback and asked her why she thought that. And Julie started telling her about this shopping list that she found in Mark's stuff that had some concerning items on it, including syringes, nicotine, booze, and the phrase, bag hands. Uh, So she surmised that Mark was potentially going to try and kill her with a drug overdose and make it look like a suicide. She said there were other things that she just couldn't explain, but she just felt something was going to happen. Julie said that she'd come up with a plan to get herself and the kids away from Mark and that she was looking for a place to go in Illinois because she feared that Mark would find them if they went to a local shelter or even to stay with any of Julie's own relatives. At around the same time, the end of November, Julie also called Officer Kosman and left him two different voice messages. In the first voicemail, Julie asked the officer to call her as soon as possible. In the second message, Julie sounded a lot more confused and scared, and she said that she thought Mark was trying to kill her. Officer Kosman was actually on a trip when Julie called and left these messages, so he didn't get them until he returned. And when he did get these voicemails, he set up a meeting with Julie right away. When Julie met up with him, she was very emotional, nervous, and she seemed terrified. She explained how Mark had been acting really strangely and doing these things in secret, all while complaining that Julie wasn't being romantic enough. She told the officer about the suspicious things that she had discovered, including these weird shopping lists. Another list that Julie found included aspirin, razor blades, and syringes, and she said that these are all things that nobody in their family would normally be buying. Julie told Officer Kosman that if she were to end up dead, Mark should be the first suspect and to let him know that she would not have killed herself. As they talked more, Officer Kosman was able to calm Julie down, and by the end of the conversation, she did say that she didn't think Mark would actually hurt her. Julie did tell Officer Kosman that she had taken photos of parts of Mark's day planner and computer screen, and she gave those photos along with a letter to her neighbor, Brian. 
After this meeting, Julie ended up giving the film to the officer, but she left the letter with Brian. And they did develop the film, but most of the photos were poor quality. And Julie told the neighbor, Brian, that after that, she worried that Officer Kosman probably thought that she was just crazy. This is all so wild to me, like that she's even now has been made friends with this police officer over the course of like this many years, years. And that he even suspects, you know, he already thinks that something's off about her husband, Mark. You know, he already suspects that he's the one behind these photos. And now she's coming to him and saying... I'm really scared like that he is trying to like not just kill me, but specifically that he's trying to poison me. Like this is the evidence I've gathered that points me in that direction. And that she was writing these letters in advance and like, like genuinely telling other people, like if something happens, many other people, right? Yeah. And the thing that makes me really sad is that she is able to talk herself out of some of these things. Like time and time again, we've seen where she says, well, the officer probably thinks I'm crazy or, you know, or I don't really think he's going to do this or whatever. So it's like his manipulation is actually working on her in those situations where she's like thinking, no, my husband would never do this to me, knowing he is doing that to her. It just, oh man, it just breaks my heart. So on November 29th, Brian saw Julie again, and this time she told him she thought Mark was actively putting poison in her food and drinks and that she was so concerned about it, she had eaten nothing the entire weekend. Brian said that when he saw Julie, she was in bad shape and that she was shaking and crying. The next day, Julie told Brian's wife that Mark was insisting that their youngest son go to preschool full time. She also said that Mark told her that he'd kill her before divorcing her. Brian's wife later said that she and Brian never went to the police because they felt like it wasn't their business. She didn't think anything would actually happen to Julie, and she wanted Brian to stay out of it. On December 1st, Julie again spoke to Brian's wife and said she really did think that Mark was trying to hurt her. Julie went to see her family doctor later that day, and when she got there, she was visibly upset and she was complaining about her marital problems. She told the doctor that she believed that Mark was still holding a grudge against her for the affair that she had had in the past. Julie said she was experiencing symptoms such as loss of appetite, and she had lost eight pounds since she had last seen the doctor in September. She said she thought there was a family history of alcoholism and depression, but she said she was not suicidal and that her kids meant everything to her, and she would do anything she could to be with them. Dr. Borman concluded that Julie was not suicidal and he prescribed Paxil to treat her depression and anxiety and referred her to counseling. He told her to come back to follow up with him in two weeks. It's unclear exactly what happened, but when Julie began taking the Paxil, she did have a bad reaction to it. After Julie got home from the doctor, Mark turned into super husband and started really taking care of Julie. On December 2nd at 6.32 in the morning, Mark was back at his computer researching pretty sketchy terms. He accessed a site titled Ethylene Glycol, which explained the effects and stages of ethylene glycol poisoning. On this website, Mark could have learned that a person suffering from this type of poisoning could be near death in just over 24 hours if they didn't get medical treatment. The symptoms of ethylene glycol poisoning range from apparent drunkenness to serious flu-like symptoms. Four minutes later, he accessed a different website on the same topic. Later on that morning, Julie's nine-year-old son was getting ready to leave for school and noticed that his mom was really sick. So Derek actually called his friend and asked if his friend's mom could give him a ride to school that day. Derek told his friend that he was actually really, really worried about his mom, and he didn't understand or really know why his dad wasn't taking her to the hospital that morning. And while he was on the phone with his friend, he kind of imitated this heavy breathing and these noises that Julie was making. This part is just so disturbing to me yeah. um, that, you know, even a nine-year-old little boy was like, something is really not right here. Like my, like mom needs, needs help. And for whatever reason, like dad is my not taking not her to the hospital. Yeah. Right. Um, so that same morning, Brian's wife noticed that Mark didn't leave for work until much later than usual. And after he left, Julie actually called Brian's wife. During this phone call, Julie sounded strangely intoxicated considering the fact that it was early in the morning, and she told Brian's wife that she wasn't feeling well, and she was really surprised that her new medication would be affecting her to this level as much as it was. 
at this point, Brian's wife just had a really weird feeling. And she later said that she didn't know what it was, but there was something about the way Julie sounded that day that made her just not want to hang up the phone with her. She really just wanted to do something to help. But Julie just kept telling her that Mark was taking good care of her. And unfortunately, this was the last time that Brian's wife ever spoke to Julie. Later on that day, Mark called Dr. Borman and told him that Julie was having trouble sleeping and asked if he could prescribe something. Dr. Borman gave Mark some Ambien samples to give to Julie, but he didn't reach out to speak to Julie himself. He told Mark to discontinue the other medication she was on and to take her to the emergency room if her condition worsened. Mark returned home and at 1047 that night, he looked up a site entitled Antifreeze Poisoning that gave details about unconsciousness and weak pulses. Mark actually erased the computer's search history that night. At 7.40 a.m. the next morning, December 3rd, Mark once again was searching the internet for ethylene glycol poisoning, and he visited at least three different sites on the subject. He also double-deleted his internet history. A short time later, the principal from the school called looking for Julie to let her know that she got the job she had recently interviewed for. Mark answered the phone and said that Julie was asleep and she'd be asleep for a long time. And then he laughed. Mark didn't go to work that day, which Brian noticed and thought was strange as Mark was never home during the day. He did leave in the late afternoon to go pick up the boys from their schools, and when they returned home is when Mark found Julie dead, allegedly of unknown reasons. And we still have more to get into after one last break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. And now back to the episode. So before the break, we had just explained how Julie Jensen was found dead in her bed on the afternoon of December 3rd, 1998. Prior to her death, her husband Mark had spent months researching various ways to poison someone and how long those overdoses might take, what the symptoms were, etc. Mark called 911 to report that he had just found his wife dead after coming home from picking his kids up from school. Detective Paul Ratzberg and another officer from the Pleasant Prairie Police Department responded to the 911 call and found Mark in the kitchen of the home attempting to use the phone. He appeared visibly upset, and he pointed them down the hallway to indicate where they could find Julie. It was clear when they arrived that Julie had been dead for a while, so there were no attempts made to revive her, but there were instantly a ton of questions about what happened to her. Mark gave his story about how Julie had started these new medications and may have just had a bad reaction. He told the detective that Julie was so bad off that morning that she couldn't even sit up in bed, much less move around on her own. But for whatever reason, he did not call an ambulance or evidently even bother to check on her throughout the day until the late in the afternoon, which also just blows my mind and immediately seems suspicious. Because if you're telling the officer like that she was in that condition in the morning right. and then saying, I found her dead, how many hours later? Eight, nine hours later? Like my first question is you didn't go in there and check on her at any point during the day after that. Like He even no admitted sense. to going back to the house. Like it's not like right. he was away at work all day. He went back to the house and then went to run errands like – he very easily could have found where she was to check on her. Right, he exactly. Yeah. So because of all these unusual circumstances surrounding Julie's death, the DA was called in to determine whether or not an investigation was warranted. The DA ended up agreeing that something was really suspicious about everything. So they decided to start formally investigating the case as potential foul play. Detective Ratzberg told Mark that he wanted to look into the potential cause of Julie's death, and that meant that Mark would have to find another place to stay for the night. Mark said that wouldn't be a problem and he would be able to stay with his father. So he actually read over and signed the consent document allowing investigators access to the house. The search lasted for two days and then Mark was allowed to go home. And we're going to get into exactly what they found in that search a little bit later. Later on that same night, there were neighbors gathering outside the Jensen home just trying to find out what happened. As we said before, Julie was very close with her neighbors, specifically Brian. So everybody really was wondering what all the commotion was that was going on there that day. Mark and his father walked outside and addressed the neighbors and told them that Julie had a bad reaction to medication and that she unfortunately died. All the neighbors were absolutely shocked. They could not believe what they were hearing. Many of them, as we said, kind of knew what had been going on. So hearing that this is what happened to her, I'm sure they were kind of, everybody had to have been like, whoa, like what is yeah. going on here? So according to one of the neighbors, Mark delivered this news with really no emotion whatsoever. He was just very matter-of-fact about it. 
Also that night, Julie's brother Paul showed up at the Jensen home. And while he was there, he overheard Mark and his dad having this very loud argument. And it seemed that they were arguing over what to tell the police or specifically what not to tell the police. On December 4th, which was the day after Julie's death, Brian gave Detective Ratzberg the letter that Julie had given him. The letter read, quote, Pleasant Prairie Police Department, Ron Cosman or Detective Ratzenberg. I took this picture and am writing this on Saturday, November 21st, 1998 at 7 a.m. This list was in my husband's business daily planner, not meant for me to see. I don't know what it means, but if anything happens to me, he would be my first suspect. Our relationship has deteriorated to the polite superficial. I know he's never forgiven me for the brief affair I had with that creep seven years ago. Mark lives for work and the kids. He's an avid surfer of the internet. Anyway, I do not smoke or drink. My mother was an alcoholic, so I limit my drinking to one or two a week. Mark wants me to drink more with him in the evenings. I don't. I would never take my life because of my kids. They are everything to me. I regularly take Tylenol and multivitamins. Occasionally, I take over-the-counter stuff for colds, Zantac, or Imodium. I have one prescription for migraine tablets, which Mark uses more than I. I pray I'm wrong and nothing happens, but I am suspicious of Mark's suspicious behaviors and fear for my early demise. However, I will not leave Derek and Daryl, my life's greatest love, accomplishment, and wish. My three Ds, Daddy, Derek, and Daryl. Signed, Julie C. Jensen. So the envelope and the letter were sent to the state crime lab along with other known writing samples of Julie's, and it was determined that Julie did write this letter. The letter confirmed investigators' suspicions that Julie's death was not an accident. At some point on the same day, Brian and his wife witnessed Mark and his father high-fiving in the driveway and appeared to be celebrating happily. By the end of the day, the search of the Jensen home was over, and they had seized Mark's computer and sent it off for analysis. It took a really long time to go through everything on the hard drive, but the technician was able to find the following things. So many pictures of penises right off the bat. (laughs) Just tons of pictures of penises. Many of them were the same images that he had been using to torture Julie with by planting them around their house for years. It was also learned that Mark deleted his search history, but the technician was able to recover most of it. There was a period of time from October 19th to November 10th that they weren't able to find, though. So in total, they found 2,100 2,100 hits for the word poison when the computer files were searched. All the searches were really concerning, but one that stood out in particular was at 7.40 a.m. on the morning of Julie's death, and that was when Mark searched for ethylene glycol poisoning and visited three websites about it. Detective Ratzberg remembered back to when Mark told him that Julie was incapacitated and could hardly sit up that morning and that he was propping her up in bed at 7.30. That's specifically what Mark said, which was 10 minutes before he went searching for ethylene glycol poisoning on the internet. So something important to note, though, is that investigators actually did not find any evidence or trace of ethylene glycol in the Jensen residence or in their garage. Also found on the computer were all the flirtatious emails between Mark and his coworker Kelly starting on September 3rd, 1998, which was three months before Julie's death. These emails discussed what Mark and Kelly planned to do about their respective spouses and how they could start what they called cleaning up their lives so that they could be together and even go on a cruise the following year. Mark's internet searches for poisoning actually coincided with the days that he and Kelly were emailing each other. So, for example, on the day that Mark was looking at botulism, he was also planning his future with Kelly via email, which is like so totally romantic. Super romantic. So when Kelly would ask Mark how he planned to take care of his details, he would actually just evade the question. He never mentioned divorcing Julie. And furthermore, there were no searches on his computer for topics like separation, divorce, or child custody. He just went straight for ethylene glycol poisoning. Yeah. The DA later said that everything found on Mark's computer helped really tell the story of what actually happened to Julie, and it showed a possible motive to her murder, which would be the affair that her husband was having. It also showed that Mark was definitely looking up different ways to kill Julie ahead of time. An autopsy was performed on Julie by Dr. Michael Chambliss, who found unexplained bruising on Julie's throat and patachier in the upper chest. 
Tachyae is caused by a hemorrhage of capillaries and looks like small red or purple spots on the skin. It can be caused by physical trauma, such as heart coughing, holding your breath, or vomiting or crying. The doctor was not able to determine Julie's cause of death. The investigation into what happened continued anyway, and the detectives interviewed multiple people, including Brian and his wife, the teacher that Julie had confided in at the school, as well as Officer Cosman, who we spoke about earlier, who was the detective that was responding to all these calls of the penis pictures. Through these interviews, detectives learned about all the times Julie had told other people that she thought her husband Mark was trying to kill her. In the meantime, Mark's out there living his best life. He even kept his two boys living in the same house where Julie died, and he asked a friend whether or not it would be appropriate to bring Kelly to Julie's wake and her funeral. Of course that's not appropriate. If you have to ask that question, you already know the answer. But he said he would just tell people that she was an out-of-town friend. And it was just within days of Julie's death that Mark had Kelly start staying overnight there. At the funeral, Mark showed little sign that he was grieving. He stood a few feet from Julie's casket with a group of other men around him while he laughed and joked, and other funeral attendees thought it was just odd. I'm a big believer that everyone grieves in a different way, but this doesn't look good on top of everything else. For sure, else. yeah. So days after Julie was laid to rest, neighbors watched as Mark threw out all of her clothes, her shoes, crafting supplies, and her sewing machine. At some point, Mark told his friend and coworker Stephen that he was surprised that police hadn't seized his work computer. And then the next Monday, Stephen noticed that Mark had a new computer at work. He said that the old computer was just fried, so he had to get a new one. Stephen recalled the time that Mark had been looking up drug interactions on his work computer, you know, that one that he no longer had. And so in mid-December, Mark's company had a Christmas party, which his coworkers actually wanted to postpone out of respect for Mark having just lost his wife. But Mark insisted that the party go on, and he had a great time drinking, laughing, and flirting the night away. Hmm. In January of 1999, Julie's brother Paul went to the police with his concerns and suspicions about his sister's death. While they weren't sure of Julie's cause of death yet, Paul said that he didn't believe it was possible that she had taken her own life because she never talked about suicide before, didn't leave a note, and most of all, he felt that she would not have left her kids behind. Speaking of kids, also in January, Mark had a birthday party for their oldest son and invited Kelly to attend, and he went around the party introducing her as a friend of his. In April of 1999, detectives wanted to speak with Mark again, but his attorney had already told him not to talk to the police, so they actually didn't expect that he would talk to them. But to their surprise, Mark said sure. He said he did want to talk because he knew Julie's death was a suicide and he wanted to clear things up. Mark was asked about all these penis portraits that he and Julie had been finding all around their property since 1992, and he asked whether or not the man that Julie had this affair with, or possibly a prowler, could have been responsible for Julie's death. And Mark actually said that it really wasn't likely or possible. He denied knowing where the pornographic pictures came from, but he said that he did believe the ones sent to him at work were coming from Julie's former lover. Mark said that he started saving the photos, so he's now alleging... He was getting real photos from some right. stranger at his job. Now he says he started saving those photos and using them to repeatedly upset Julie anytime something would happen that would cause him to get upset with her. That's so he, convenient for him that he's just getting these penis pictures that he right. knows upsets her and now he can reuse, reduce, right. reuse, recycle. He's exactly. doing it. Exactly. Yeah. So he said that sometimes he would just leave these photos out somewhere for Julie to find, which I also like. What about the children? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, this guy's not thinking about the children. Yeah. And sometimes he said that he would just um, take them out and, t and just show them to Julie himself and say something stupid like, I found these in the shed or something and get her to look at them. So Mark said that his relationship with Julie really was never the same after her affair. He denied that his relationship with Kelly was sexual and he acted really surprised when he learned about the letter that Julie wrote before her death. Ultimately, he denied having anything to do with it. After this interview, Mark's lawyer ended up calling the police and told them they would not be speaking to Mark again. Before April was over, Paul went back to the police and found out that they were investigating Julie's death as a homicide. Police gave Paul equipment to record all of Mark's phone calls. 
According to Julie's family's website, Mark called often just to talk about nothing. In September, Mark and the kids moved to a new, even fancier home in Kenosha, and two months later, Kelly moved in with them. The neighbors in the new neighborhood said that Mark wasn't friendly at all. He was cold and he was standoffish. They also said that Mark had the kids calling Kelly mother, and they referred to Julie as the woman we used to live with, which breaks my my heart. Julie's family didn't see the kids for more than just a few moments after she died. In January of 2002, Mark and Kelly announced that they were engaged, and they planned to get married on May 3rd of that year. But little did Mark know, medical examiners and toxicologists have been working behind the scenes for the last three years to figure out what really happened to Julie, and things were about to come crashing down for Mark and his new dream life. And we're going to get into all of it next week. (laughs) Because we're the worst. But <laughs> you knew that week, was coming. We gave yeah, you a warning it, up front that we were going to do two parts. So <laughs> Very fair. Very fair. So n- if you would like to hear part two right now, go to patreon.com slash moms and mysteries podcast and you can sign up to get uh, early release ad free episodes. Or if you're an Apple subscriber, you can sign up for the Apple Plus for Moms and Mysteries and you'll have it now. All right, Melissa, are you ready to turn the page and move on to last thing before we go this week? I sure am. Okay. So we asked you guys what we should do for last thing before we go this week. We posted that's, on That's where we're at. <laughs> yeah, we posted on Instagram and Facebook. I guess that's it, right? Where yeah. we posted. That's where we yeah. posted. We actually have a couple of questions from you guys that you want the answers to. So Melissa, do you want to get us started with the first listener question? Yes. And so I try not to pick things we've been asked a lot. I try to do a little outside the box. This one is great. This is from Christy Lane. My family and I are moving to Florida soon. Tips on how to become, how to avoid becoming a Florida woman headline. Also, are alligators really a threat there? Because my kids have no fear and I could easily see becoming a headline for being eaten by one. Mandy, okay. how do you stay out of the being headlines. a Florida woman? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't really know that I do anything to stay out of the headlines, honestly. Sometimes I'm surprised I haven't been in the headlines. Right? <laughs> I know. But, I mean, because I, I don't know what I would be in the headlines for, honestly. Melissa, what would I be in the headlines for? It would Oof. be something with an animal, for sure, like trying to kidnap like a wild oh, or protected. Yeah. Like, yeah. like one like of the peacocks not knowing... that are like at the that park that we've been to before. Yeah. But they're actually mean. But yeah, so it would be something They're like so that, mean and they're so <laughs> scary. You think they're beautiful and they're going to kill you. So today on my walk, I actually saw a snake, which isn't something I normally see, but we do have snakes, so that's yeah. not like totally weird. Honestly, if you're moving to Central Florida, I'd be more scared of bears than alligators. You see, yeah, I mean, alligators. I mean, yeah, although I will say, every summer I feel like, and like even recently, yeah. I've seen things about alligators in the headlines. So yeah, I mean, I feel like alligators are a threat. I guess, I guess you just have to respect their home and stay and watch out of it. for signs. <laughs> My sister had us meet her one time in this like little creek thing, and I got there and immediately see a sign that says like alligators running rampant right. is basically what it said. I'm like, hey, did you see this? She's like, I never saw that sign. She'd gone there like five <laughs> times before. <laughs> so I was like, well, I'm not getting my kids in the water. So be respectful of the signs. You should be fine. We can't avoid being Florida women. We we are. You kind of have to take just that. Just are, yeah. Yeah, it just happens. <laughs> was there got, another Mandy? part to that question? I felt like there was two parts, but maybe I... Oh, how do you avoid becoming all. one and should you be worried about oh, alligators? So, okay. So yeah, so we answer them both. Okay. So um, Mandy number two, Mandy Delp, Yay. she's been a long time listener. She always um, sends us in ideas whenever we post for these. Yeah. So I um, just, she asked, she asked several questions. So I'm just going to pick one. So Melissa, do you have a nickname? She wants to know nicknames for both of us, either given by family when we were little or now. Okay, so Mandy came up with a nickname for me in this week's episode. I've I never knew been you were going to bring this up, <laughs> <laughs> but I caught it in the writing, Melly, which I've yeah. never been called. I'm willing to go for it. That one's kind of cute. I just threw it in there because I know you don't like Mel, so I was like, I wonder. I hate Mel. I wonder how mm-hmm. she'll respond to Melly. So I just Melly's cute. I just casually wrote it on the. In the uh, research, yeah. <laughs> where <laughs> I found it, um, but my actual nickname. Okay, in high school, it was Chuck because I was afraid of the Chucky doll, and I forgot about that until I was at McDonald's the other day, and she goes, are you Chuck? And I was like, no, but I used to be. <laughs> like, it was a moment. My family nickname has been Momo for years, and so 
my nephew and niece call me Aunt Momo, my brother-in-law, all my family. I'm just Momo. And that's, I don't, it started with my brother calling me mom and then being like, oh, uh, Melissa. And uh, whenever he was smaller and now I'm just Momo. What about you? I'm not going to call you that. I don't think it's appropriate for me to call you that. Honestly, I think it's a family nickname. I would be okay. Like, give me Melly, but like, even my daughter is like not okay with a different niece calling me Momo. She's like, she can call you Aunt Melissa. And I'm yeah. like, dang, this <laughs> That's funny. Um, well, actually, this might be surprising to some people to hear. So, for a really long time, I actually just went by Amanda which is yeah. my name. It sounds weird to say now. You give a name. I know. So um, people were calling me Mandy, of course. My family, my parents always called me Mandy growing up when I was a kid, and my little sister always called me Mandy. And then at some point when I was in high school, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to s- go all in and start going by Mandy, and I have mm-hmm. ever since. I went through a brief period in my early 20s, I think, where I tried going back to Amanda for a couple of years, and it just didn't really work out. Like by that point, everybody – already was calling me Mandy. So yeah. now it is just my name. But like technically that is my nickname. <laughs> yeah. No, that's true. Amanda. You could have done that. You got yeah. really Oh, and on Selling Set that Sunset there was a girl named Amanza. And I've never heard that, but you could have really yeah. had some fun with it. Yeah. I also have one other nickname. Sorry, when I was a kid, Lissa Lou. I just came up with that. But go ahead. I mean I, I just remember that. Yeah. I mean nobody that's... likes the name Melissa. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, we'll call you anything else. No, I like Melly. I think Melly's going to stick for me. <laughs> I actually like it. I will I will take it. I'll accept it. Yeah. I was like, that's okay. That'll stay. Yeah, I like that question. <laughs> All right. Do you have uh, another question? I do. Um, let's go with Alyssa May underscore four. It just says Bucky's question mark. And okay. the answer is yes. Bucky's for okay. sure. Right, Mandy? Okay. I just recently went to Bucky's for the very first time. Yes. And um, it was really something. I wasn't, I didn't know what I was expecting, but like, right. It was, it exceeded my expectations, I guess. Yeah. I mean, you know, I always have been a big lover of Wawa, which personally I think has gone downhill, at least here in Florida in the last couple yeah. of years. I really have like kind of gotten away from like my Wawa obsession, but um, I was expecting, so I, I kind of like knew about like the whole idea of having like a right. gas station that has more going on than just that. Yeah, I was kind of blown away. There's like, like I could spend Honestly, the day at Bucky's. <laughs> you could. You could plan an entire day. So if you're not familiar with Bucky's, it's a gas station. But when people it's like a lifestyle, I would say. Yeah. Because they like have straight up bathing suits now. They have all this stuff. Like my kids did not care to go. It was like five in the morning when we went, because there's only like one on ninety-five. So I was like, we have to do it now or never. And they were all like mad at me for making them go. And then everybody comes out with a hat and you know, different <laughs> bucky stuff. There's all kinds of food and desserts and these yes, things I, called beaver nuggets. And yeah, it's just amazing. Yeah, I ate a you're going to be like, why would you do that? I or why? <laughs> I ate a, a turkey sandwich, barbecue turkey sandwich. I know you're probably thinking I should have gotten something like way more, more exciting, but it was yeah. so delicious. It was really good. I know. Everything's good. I got like a coconut cream pie pudding oh, thing yeah. or something. Oh, yeah. that was so good. Um, But the thing to be that you don't expect is how bright it is. And it could be that we just came in at five in the morning, right. but it was like <laughs> lit up. <laughs> Bucky's was up. Yeah, they were they were ready for us. So yeah, if you ever have a chance to see Bucky's, you'll see lots of signs. Definitely stop in. It's it's pretty fun. So yeah, I like that question. Awesome. Which was just Bucky's question mark. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um do you want to do one more? Yeah. Okay. So the last one is from our very own Haley. No. She just wants to know if we have any personal or professional goals that we want to share for the rest of this year. <laughs> um Personal I don't know why I'm laughing. I'm not laughing at her question. <laughs> personal and professional is personal survival. Or professional. <laughs> Mine is for both. Survival. Just survival. Yeah. I don't really have any – I don't know that I have any. Keep making the show. Keep making the show yeah. better. Right? Yeah. I feel like um, I like setting goals, and I think setting goals is really important. But – yeah. I don't, I I also have periods of time in my life when I just don't really have like a goal necessarily where I'm just kind of like, all right, well, I'm trying to improve on things I've already like started and established. So I don't know. I really just like, to be honest, I don't think I have any like new goals 
this year that what I don't Mandy's saying that I'm not already working on. <laughs> is she's already perfect and you don't change perfection. <laughs> I'm saying my list is too long and I will not bore you all <laughs> with those things. Um, I'm trying to sleep better. That's like a goal I have. And okay, me too, actually. And I learned from the information from my bed that it actually worked. Apparently, I had my highest averaging sleep score ever in the month of March, like since I've had my sleep number bed. Really? Yeah. So apparently it's working. I've been trying to get to bed earlier and sleep better. And again, just reaching your goals. <laughs> just, it's, all, it's only uphill for you. And Melly is just barely scraping by on the floor. <laughs> Oh, thank you guys for sending in questions. Those are fun. We'll have to do some more again soon. I know we got some requests to do the art thing again, which I definitely think we have to do. Do you remember the Rick and Randy's art show where oh, we, we definitely have to describe bring that them? Back. Yeah. yeah, I think maybe I'm thinking maybe next week that might maybe be fun. we can do that next week. Yeah. All right. Well, that was awesome, Melissa. Thank you as usual for being here Mandy, with me. <laughs> thank you as usual. Thank you, wonderful listeners, for listening. <laughs> All right, guys, that's it for this week. We will be back next week with part two of this story. Same time, same place, same story. <laughs> Have a great week. Bye. <laughs>